Hopefully you can hear me in this echo chamber. Can you hear me in the echo chamber? Yeah. Um, in our I, new school, we have like no echo chamber. <laughs> in our cafeteria. Let's, just, let's pretend we're doing lunch duty today, okay? Okay. Uh, welcome to People's Elementary School. Welcome to the elementary visioning um, uh, activity that we're doing this evening. Uh, there are some people I'd like to introduce from the one little schools in the audience. You have uh, Principal North. Yeah. You have Principal Caponito. You have Amory Serene from School Committee. Susan Sleesman, the Director of Learning and Teaching. Ed Donnie, the Director of Business Services. And everything I don't want to do. You have Peter Meyer from the Town, Board of Selecta. And we have uh, distinguished faculty here, staff here. Yeah. And parents, which is great as well, so thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, about uh, two years ago, we started the process with the MSBA to look at what would be next for people's elementary school. Uh, given the age of this building, given the investment in this building, in which we put uh, money towards, uh, some people would say good money towards bad money. Uh, we're trying to do like a, as best as abatement at $100,000 a year, but also looking at the uh, modernization of this facility or what's next for People's Elementary School. Uh, we have uh, gone through an extensive process with MSBA, which has very tight guidelines for how you go through this and what you do. And I would like to introduce a couple of people that are involved with us. Um, uh, quite involved actually because the school building committee meeting, school building, oh, I'm going to go over the agenda first. I'm going to do introductions which I just did, but uh, I won't talk about MSBA process, uh, Joel Seeley will, uh, project schedule, study scope, educational visioning, and then questions at the end. We hope to get this all within about two hours this evening. Okay? Uh, we do have a, a, a school building committee which is made up of quite a few people. Uh, and we've gone through the process now of meeting. We're starting to meet every two weeks now. It's, uh, it's a large group. There's a lot to get done. Um, okay. So that, that was the build, uh, the school, build, school building committee. Excuse me for uh, following through that. I'd like to introduce the most important people in this project, and the other ones who are going to lead us down this MSBA framework uh, that is very extensive. Uh, some of us have had to go to Boston on a regular basis to uh, argue and support this project. But through the process, we were able to um, uh, interview and, and have now hired an owner's project manager, which is Joel Seeley right here. Uh, Joel Seeley is, uh, works for us. <laughs> and he will do all of the oversight for the Bourne community. He represents the Bourne community in this project. Um, since then, we've also had a designer uh, team that's going to look at the feasibility of what's next for elementary education within the Bourne community. And there are many options, there are at least three options right now. One is a, is a renovation of this building. One is a um, uh, raise this building to build a new one here. And another option is building an addition on Colonial Elementary School. We wanted to explore every option we could possibly explore. There has been no decision made on that at this point. And that's what they're here for. They're here to look at the whole design plan, get feedback from the community, look at everything that we have and what we're about, and then we will make our recommendations with the information that they provide. I know the research that they do, and they'll talk about that as well. But we have Ken Kovacs, who's the principal and lead architect for Flansburg Associates, Flansburg Architects, excuse me, Architects, who is the uh, feasibility group for us. And then uh, the consultant they brought in to look at the educational component, because believe it or not, the most important part of this process is educational visioning and what we expect around education for our students in the Bourne community moving forward. It's not that we have to fit our educational visioning into the facility, the facility has to fit our educational visioning. <clears throat> and so we have what I think is uh, one of the best educational consultants for an architects group. We have David Seeley here this evening, who will be uh, helping us and walking us through the education visioning. Okay? Um, at this point, then, I'm going to turn it over to Joel Seeley. Good evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about the overall process. And as um, Superintendent Lamarsh has indicated, uh, no decisions have been made. This is a feasibility study to determine what is best for the town as it relates to your elementary 
school. Um, your partner in all of this is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or, or MSBA. And as the superintendent has, has indicated, uh, the town has been working with the MSBA over these last two years. The MSBA has a very prescribed process to follow, first through the feasibility phase, the feasibility study, to make sure that all options are investigated, all, all um, elements of each one of those options are investigated, and there's a lot of dialogue with the community as it relates to those before any decisions have been made. It's a very prescribed process. If we follow that process, MSBA will participate in reimbursing the overall project. As it stands right now, the feasibility study uh, phase uh, in which you've appropriated the, the funding of uh, at the last uh, town meeting, MSBA will, will uh, reimburse approximately 43.84% uh, of the cost to this feasibility study. So it's very important as a town that we follow their, their prescribed process, that we communicate and have a lot of open and transparent dialogue with the community. And the building committee is, is following those exact uh, requirements. The MSBA study process is, comprises three elements. One is the um, PDP phase or preliminary design program. That first part of the feasibility study is to review all the options that are possible as it relates to the development of the elementary school uh, program. Um, that phase uh, will then develop the options. There will be, be discussions with the community. There will be discussions at the building committee. There will be estimates developed, cost estimates developed, as far as what each one of those uh, could potentially cost as it relates to a project. After that phase, the, uh, the town will take the top three uh, of those options and further study those in what is called the preferred schematic or PSR phase. Uh, at that end of that phase, um, there will be a uh, selection of the most preferred option, the one that really suits the town the best for a variety of reasons, and all of those metrics will be thoroughly reviewed in a transparent process. That will then go to the MSPA Board of Directors, who will then ratify, uh, if we've done all of our job right, ratify that, um, that uh, preferred option and then allow the town to go into what is called schematic design phase or, or SD phase in which uh, detailed drawings and detailed uh, design development will happen for that option. So we'll know the, uh, the exact cost of what that may be. So it's, it's a long process. We're just beginning the process now. I know you can't read this, but these, this is posted up on the town's website under the school building committee. We have a website in which we post all of our documents. Uh, this document is posted under the heading called Project Schedule. Uh, that PD phase, PDP phase, that initial phase, will end in December. The PSR phase will end in um, April, and it will make its way to the MSBA Board of Directors meeting in June. Um, we'll seek validation from the MSBA Board of Directors uh, to proceed into the schematic design phase, and then that schematic design phase will make its way to the summer and finish up at the end of the summer, early fall, 2016. So, you can see the duration of the feasibility study. It's not a, it's not a really quick form the study in a vacuum and uh, make the uh, conclusions. It is a long process with, in which the community is highly engaged. Uh, this is the first of many community meetings that we'll have throughout the overall process. Uh, we'd ask that uh, you uh, take a look at the town's website to be uh, current with whatever um, uh, community meetings that we have. We do meet just about every two weeks at the building committee and all of those meetings are posted as well. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to, um, to Ken who can talk a little more in detail about the main options. Great. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so these are the three options that are being studied. The conversation with the MSBA and the district uh, throughout the years resulted in these three main options. There's a K-4 for 250 students followed by option two, which is a K-4 for 725 students. So that's an all-district school, kindergarten through fourth grade. And the final option we study is a K-5. That also is an all-district school, but incorporates the fifth grade at 885 students. And um, so with that option, 
there's an impact on the middle school. It takes that load off of the middle school and it frees it up a bit. But so that's the meaning of five students in the large school. And so without going into the design of addition, renovation, new construction, this is our focus right now. It's just study needs. And um, um, we're also evaluating existing conditions of both sites and meeting with the school with programming and digital programming. With this, it's going to result in those options that uh, Joel just mentioned. And again, this is the focus. There's two sites. There's the People's Elementary, where we are now, which is uh, an all-campus site with the high school and the middle school. And then the Borndale uh, Elementary School, which is a 2009 building. And so the, this is the focus. These are the two sites that we're going to pair those three options with. And that's what the, uh, the, the study is going to uh, uncover. What, what's the best option that we're going to come up with? And, and with that, I will turn it over to David. We'll be this in our educational activity session tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to come up a little closer. As a teacher, I want to rearrange this room. <laughs> and I want to get rid of some of the sound effects, which is, which is a good thing. Because any new building that you get, or renovated building, the system, you're going to have heat that works properly, and, and classrooms that feel comfortable, natural light, and systems that work, and a, and a really robust technology infrastructure. So, um, so that's something that we can all feel excited about. Uh, so my role in this whole thing is to help guide what's called the educational visioning process. And this is a process that um, is, didn't, it, it, in the past it wasn't required by the MSBA, but I think now pretty much most of their projects, they're requiring it. And what they're trying to do is to make sure that, that, um, that schools have the opportunity to take full advantage of what it means to be able to conceptualize and design a new school. Now you did that just six years ago with the Borndale, so you, and, you have a, and you have a wonderful building there. Um, even in the last six years, a bunch of thinking has changed in terms of how, how we're approaching schools, and that's a lot because technology keeps developing, and we're realizing that we need our buildings to be that much more flexible um, and evolve in a way that we don't really even quite understand yet. So, so I'm both an art, a licensed architect, but I've also spent about 15 years working as a teacher and an assistant principal in schools. So I kind of left architecture, became an educator, then got back into kind of doing a mixture of the two. And because the building isn't the change, right? A build, you can have a, a, a lousy building and a great program, right? And because it's really about the teachers and it's about the program that goes on in the building. But the building can, do a lot to inform change and to support kind of relationships within the building and experiences for students that make the experience that much better. So that we're going to talk a little bit about that. There, yes, here we go. So in the visioning process, we've already had one workshop with what we're calling the Ed Leadership Team. And we've been looking at some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today. Learning goals and best practices. Um, we want to talk, and that's what we're going to be doing tonight, is talking about 21st century teaching and learning, which in a lot of ways is a lot like 20th century teaching and learning, but there are different things that are, we are enabled now by technology and ways that the world is changing and the economy is changing that make us think as educators. We need to give our kids different sets of skills. Oh, and post-secondary -educa post education is changing too. So we need to give our kids different sets of skills in addition to all the basics we've been thinking about. So we're going to talk about that some tonight um, and get into some kind of discussions in smaller groups. Let me just get a gauge from people. How many people here are teachers or work for the school system? If you could raise your hand. Okay. And how many people are parents? Okay. And how many people are community members that are just coming to join in? Okay. So when we, when we get into groups talking about 21st century skills, I'm going to suggest that we mix it up a little bit and the teachers get into groups with the parents so that the educators and the parents can have some more interesting discussions. Um, so we're going to talk about learning goals and best practices. Um, I'm going to talk also about design patterns. And those are really, or maybe we could call them design possibilities as well, because a lot of us have an idea of a school. It's a hallway with classrooms on either side and there are lockers and there's a gym and an auditorium and, and, and an administrative area and a cafeteria. 
But we're thinking about schools in some different ways now. The MSBA is, is really trying to explore how to get maximum benefit out of every dollar that they and you as a community put into a new school building. And to really look at the relationships between spaces and how you can create sort of, sort of synergy between those spaces. And we're, we're also gonna be thinking about how teachers get teamed and where kids can gather. Because the basic premise is um, that, that in a building that is fully wired, okay, and we're all kind of, in, we're at that in-between stage by, right now, but five, 10 years from now, we can assume that every kid will have a device and the building will be fully wired and anywhere you go, you're gonna be able to get on via the cloud to any program you want and it's all gonna be held there. And so it really enables learning to happen anywhere, anytime. Now, we're talking about little kids here, so there's a lot of structuring that needs to happen to give kids more independence. But a, a, a fully wired and, and technology-rich environment enables you to do sort of more kind of one on self-paced and small group work with kids, using technology to help to supplement some of the delivery of content. Did anyone see the article in the Globe today about math curriculum? There was a, there was a, in the, in the um, community section, there was an article about how eight different schools in Boston are experimenting with, with online delivery of math on the elementary and middle school level. And what these programs, they're experimenting with six different programs, all of which are high, highly interactive and enable kids to enable the teacher to very quickly analyze where a student's gaps are and it enables students to really kind of like move at their own pace and then get into small groups, and they're experimenting it with it throughout the year to see. So that's just one kind of way that technology is kind of changing the way we think. Not that it should ever replace the teacher, but that we might need more flexible environments in the school. If we're gonna have different kind of configurations of kids, sometimes working in small groups, sometimes working doing self-paced work. So if you get nothing else out of tonight, I want you to think about this. We want whatever building we design has to support evolving teaching practices and technology because that's all going to be continuing to evolve and change. Um, we're, we're in a fully wired one-to-one -one or maybe even one-to-three environment. Maybe 10 years from now, there'll be three devices. Scary, but you know we could look at also the benefits or what it might allow. Um, flexible and multi-purpose classroom spaces. We're still looking at the classroom as the basic building block. But we're also thinking about extending the learning beyond the classrooms and thinking about the between spaces. Does a cafeteria need to sit empty half the day? Or could it be a space where project-based learning could happen or a maker space or, or small groups of, you know, like a study space or things like that? So um, we're thinking about that. How do you use the between spaces? Does a hallway just have to be a hallway with lockers? Or could we widen it in certain areas and make places where small groups of kids could gather. And if we put some transparency in the building, what does that do to create sort of a sense of community? Um, and then we're also gonna be thinking about community access and use, because more and more, we know that schools are very much the center of their community. And we wanna make sure that they're usable after hours and on weekends. And so in order to do that, we can think about what are the more public pieces or spaces within the building how do we make them most easily accessible? And how do we block off some of the other spaces? So those are some of the themes that we know we're gonna be kind of visiting as we, as we think about, um, uh, about this design. So what I wanna do though is, um, we, the other thing that we're doing, is so, so, so we've done one workshop with the leadership team. We're gonna do another workshop uh, in a couple of weeks. We, uh, I was here uh, interviewing teachers at the Borndale and the Peebles last week all day with one of our, my colleagues from Flansburg. We're trying to gather as much information as possible about how you do things and what's important to you. And, and what are the educational initiatives that you're most excited about? And what are the kinds of relationships that you really want to be fostering in the building? Um, so to that end, we have the opportunity here to gather some information from you. And on the back of your, uh, your agenda here, um, there's a sheet, and you can fill out your name or not. 
um, and it, or leave it or not, but we would love to have as much information. If you'd like to leave it with us, then we can, we can put this into the mix. Um, so the first thing, I'm going to be asking you to leave three things. One is your highest priorities for the school, right? And we're going to talk about that in a minute. We're also going to be talking about 21st century skills, and I'm going to show you a couple of videos to just get us thinking about it. Because really, for all of us that are professionals, we can see how much the world of work is changing. And that has implications for how post-secondary institutions are changing and for how our K-12 schools are changing as well. Um, so I want to just kind of open up that discussion and kind of bring, open up some issues that we can all talk about. I'm going to show you a video to get us thinking about stuff. I'm going to do a little bit of presentation about some of the things. I work with schools all around the country that are trying to define their educational program and create new buildings to support them um, that range from independent schools and public schools and charter schools. They're all thinking about the same thing. They want to make sure that they're getting the biggest bang for their buck and they're not building a building that's obsolete. Um, so, so we're going to look at that and then we're going to ask you for what you think are, your most important, are the most important 21st century um, learning goals for Bourne Elementary Schools. And then there's a place for you to talk about your outstanding questions and concerns. So that just be aware that as we go along, you can take notes or you can, um, uh, you can jot your ideas down there. What I'd like to do now is to have, just take about two minutes for everybody to just think about, jot down some ideas about what are your priority goals for the new facility. Again, you can, you can jot them down here, you can leave them with us in the end or not, but why don't we take about two minutes for just everybody to think about that, and then I've got a pad and paper over here, and we can just kind of kind of open it up to the group, and I'll, you can just kind of popcorn it out, and I'll write some of them down. Um, does that sound, sound good? So two minutes, think about your priority goals, write down some of your ideas. Oh, and we have pens over here. Who needs a pen? Raise your hand. Okay, pens over there. We have
something on this side of the bridge that was available to community um, events. Um, everything that we have, we have the Bourne Community Center over there for the Bourneville School, but the people are, for the people on this side of the bridge, um, there isn't a whole lot of options on um, community space and clubs and, and other things. So I'm going to speak for the side side. Yeah. Um, I worked at Borneo, and we had individual rooms to work in in yes. special ed. Mm -hmm. And I worked here, and I also had my desk right along here when there was no space. Right. And it was so beneficial to have small rooms to work in small groups, and I think that's a high priority too. Right. Small groups and meeting rooms. And so. And, and so we know from the Borndale, and, this, that, and that was designed even before the MSBA really had its present day configuration. There's more oversight now, making sure that special education needs are met by students and of course, universal accessibility. Um, so there's a lot of square footage that's, that's connected to breakout spaces and um, with an inclusion model so that they're located throughout the school. There's an emphasis on really spreading them throughout the school. Yeah, and that's part of that flexible environment too, because those spaces can be used in a variety of different ways. They can be used for testing or tutoring or small group work or meeting with a parent or you know, whatever whatever they need to be used for. Thank you. So larger classrooms that allow for breakouts in different ways and different ways of arrangement. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to be talking to you about flexible furniture because that's also a huge kind of um, way to enable flexibility in the classroom by having furniture that can be easily rearranged and used in different ways. Who else has Now, I heard, I heard enrichment programs. What's the second one?
Okay. Building open at night and weekends to strengthen community. All right. Thank you. Yes.
becomes, as we talk about more and more of the community college of the center. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And those are definitely going to be at the top of the list of our, you know, the architects when we're, when we're working on plans. All right. You have in front of you a paper. You can, you can list these priorities and leave them with us. We're going to be keeping track of them. Um, so we definitely love to hear from people. Um, I'm going to, we're going to now transition into looking at talking about 21st century teaching and learning and some ideas about what people think about that. And again, I want to say also just that we're, we're already, you know, 15 years into the 21st century. And a lot of people find the whole notion of 21st century learn, teaching and learning kind of jargony. And, and just kind of like, well, why is it so different? And so I, I just want to address that. Um, we're just going to talk about, I'm just going to talk about some of the things that I see around the country that people are thinking about, some of which are enabled by technology, but a lot of which really come about through trying to educate all kids and really differentiate instruction and make it accessible to kids. And, and part of it, too, is an emphasis that um, on, on, as we think about 21st century teaching and learning, even though there's so much emphasis on testing and accountability right now that's in our educational system, it really implies that kids need to be doing a lot of hands-on and applied learning as well, project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, because there's no other way to get at those higher order thinking skills that we want to be making sure that our kids are really kind of, and to get them engaged and excited about what they're doing. So those are some of the themes that will come up. Not really 21st century, they're 20th century, 19th century as well. How do, how do we learn best and how do we create environments that are as diverse as possible? But, I, but I'm going to start with a video. This is a guy named Ken Robinson. Anybody heard of him or seen his TED Talk before? He's a guy that uh, does research on creativity. And this is taken from a TED Talk he did. It's about 11 minutes long and it's animated. And I think it's a good way to just kind of just kind of get a big picture glimpse at some of the way we've organized schools up till now and why things are changing in terms of the way we're thinking about schools. So I'm going to show that and then maybe we'll have a little bit of discussion about that and then, um, and then I'm going to get into talking about a few things. We'll see another video um, of it, some elementary school kids talking about some work that they've done and then we'll do an activity around creating 21st century learning goals for, for boring elementary. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on earth, on earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. 
And some people say we have to race down as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, so, <laughs> I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raise them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you have the money. But public education paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery. That was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time, but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the enlightenment view of intelligence. The real intelligence consists in this capacity for certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education of the really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not, because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffered this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced, and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescription for ADHD. Don't mistake me, I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, children and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we have our tonsils taken out. And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising volumes, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing that for getting distracted. From what? No. Boring stuff <laughs> at school for the most part. It seems to me, not a coincidence totally, that the instance of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of the standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit order increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. Yeah. And by the time they get to Washington, they're lost it completely. Yeah. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the art particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts, especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children to education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them to sleep. We should be waking them up. 
to what they have inside themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, uh, ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's not the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. <laughs> Well, I know kids who are much better than the kids of the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day, or better in small groups than in large groups, or sometimes they have to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the work of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study on recently of divergent thinking. Published a couple of years ago, divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bovo would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways. Uh, to see that multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of example would be people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paper clip? One of those routine questions. Most people might come with 10 or 50. People who are good at this might come with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paper clip be 200 foot tall, be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paper clip as we know it, Jim? You know? um, now, the test was they gave them to 1,500 people it's in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So, my question to you is what percentage of the people tested of the 1,500 scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage of genius level? 80. 80. 80, 90%. Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later. 8 to, eight to 10, what do you think? 50. They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend in it coming. Now, this tells an interesting story, because you couldn't imagine it going the other way, could you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is, we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. You know, they spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way, it's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think definitely about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that the most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution, and the habitats that they occupy.
lot of, I mean, it's kind of funny, and he brings up a lot of points, some of which we can, we might not agree with everything he says, but, but you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of food for thought there. Um, I would love to give you a chance to talk about it and to sort of, you know, tell me what, what kind of strikes you or what you're thinking. In the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving forward because I want us to have a chance to talk about 21st century learning goals. So I'm going to um, talk about some other things. Just for about, I'm going to go really pretty quickly through this. But um, so here are some things that um, you know we can think about when we when we think about sort of how how do we how do we create schools that do what uh, Ken Robinson is saying is sort of wake our kids up to what they have inside them. Um, that, I, I think that's what as parents we all want to do. We want to give our kids the confidence and the excitement to, uh, to be to be uh, good learners, to feel confident in their ability to learn, and to be excited about what they're doing. So, um, so we, we know that there's these R's floating out there. There's the three R's that aren't really three R's that are reading, writing, and arithmetic. And that's no one saying, just like no one saying lower standards, no one saying those aren't important. They're every bit as important as they always were. Um, the question is how to really, are there different ways that we can get at it for different kids? In the 90s, when we started getting really serious about educating a much wider range of students, we talked about rigor, relevance, and relationship, how important the relationship is, um, and, and relevance. And I see that in a small learning community like you have here, and interviewing the teachers here last week, I could see you have a very strong sense of relationship um, and, and community here. Um, the four C's, has anybody heard about the four C's? Maybe our teachers have. The four C's is actually, um, it was coined by this outfit called the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, and it talks about sort of what are the things that are most important as we think about sort of this, uh, the global economy that we live in, uh, the, the sort of highly technological age where, where, that we live in where more and more you see for, on the college level, a lot of things like flipped classrooms where Kids are looking at lectures at home and then they're coming in and interacting maybe in small groups. Um, so different kind of delivery methods. So anyway, the four C's are a way to think about sort of what are the, what are the skills that are most important. Um, and they've actually been adapted and adopted by uh, the Common Core Standards uses the four C's as kind of an overlay for a lot of uh, what they talk about. Um, as well as the new science standards, the next gen science standards, and the math science standards. The four C's are all over them. And it's critical thinking, your ability, and that's really, uh, that's at the upper echelons of the Bloom's taxonomy, where knowledge is on the bottom, and that's important, and understanding that applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. It's really, because we have information coming at us from all places, it's what we do with that information, and that's what we want to be teaching our kids, how to, how to think for themselves, um, how to problem solve. Communicating is a big part of that, both verbally and, um, and in writing. Collaborating, we talk about collaboration a lot. 70% of people are engaged in collaboration in their work life. Um, how, how can we sort of get at kid, you know, really work with kids to be able to um, help them learn about what good collaboration looks like? And then creativity. A lot of uh, a lot of schools are adding uh, character or citizenship to that. And then academic mindset. Academic mindset is based on Carol Dweck's work. It's about if you've heard about the grit and perseverance. The notion that you know it's not just that you should be good at something from the beginning, but if you fail at something, that's how you learn. So we need to teach our kids that it's okay to fail and to take chances and to take risks. So. Now, many people are thinking about this. This guy, Tony Wagner, in the Global Achievement Gap, when did he interviewed businesses all around the country, business leaders are saying that what they most want, aside from the four Cs, are a sense of initiative and entrepreneurialism, which is very connected to a sense of confidence, and also agility and adaptability, because things are changing so fast. I mean, we're preparing for kids for jobs that don't exist. 
And whereas we used to talk about people changing careers three or four times maybe in the span of their work life, people are now, there's a lot more kind of like, there's a speed at which that change is happening. There's a need to be kind of learning as you go and to continue learning. So we need to, we need to work with our students, um, people are saying, to become more proactive learners and to be able to learn to learn. So this looks, means then that schools might look like more high performance workplaces or performance environments where the, there's varied environments, it's collaborative, and kids are learning to learn. Um, now we all, many of us are familiar with the open classroom of the 70s, probably a lot of us went to school in, in schools that had more of this connectivity. From a building level, I want to emphasize the open classroom didn't work very well because it was noisy. And so we know that when we talk about varied environments, for those of you that are teachers, I know you know, you need to be able to close the door. Some kids really need a quiet place where they can really focus. So you need those quiet breakout spaces as well. Um, but it's also nice to have that connectivity. And here at Peebles, I know there's a lot of kind of teaming that goes on. And you have some of your classrooms have doors between them, and teachers really appreciate that, that relationship. So, but this is not the open classroom. Um, another theme that comes up uh, is around deeper learning. If we want to teach kids how to be good critical thinkers, we need to allow them to go deeply sometimes. Not just a mile wide and an inch deep, but really get into something from time to time. And that's a hard thing to balance out as a teacher, as a school system, to think about where to do that. Um, but that, so, so this uh, deeper learning network, which is a network of about 10 different systems of schools around the country, that are doing some really interesting stuff, is focusing on the four C's, plus mastering core academic content, being a self-directed learner, and having this academic growth mindset that says, I'm not afraid to fail, I'm gonna keep working at something um, and get better at it. Blended learning is another thing that we really need to be thinking about. It's that blend of uh, online delivery and traditional delivery and small group and project-based. It's a blend of lots of things. Um, but it is sort of, when we think about technology, um, uh, and I know this from my, my six-year-old granddaughter is really into Minecraft. And on her iPad, she's designing things all the time, right? And it's an immersive technology. The stuff that's coming down the road, the way that we've been using technology in schools is really just the tip of the iceberg. And this guy, Clayton Christensen, is talking about that and how the new technology in schools is going to be much more interactive, much more immersive, virtual, gaming-oriented. That is what kids really like to do. Now, not every kid does. And this article in the Globe today was talking about how some kids are really gravitated toward this math, this math program and other kids are, they're, they're working with kids based on, on how their learning style is. And, um, and they're seeing, you know, sort of how much mileage they can get from that. But this, if we think of technology as being much more immersive and virtual, um, you know, th it's a different way to use technology. And if nothing else, we need to be thinking about how to create environments and schools and furniture um, and, and, and infrastructures that allow for that flexibility to use technology in different ways. Um, personalization can come about through use of technology. It can come about through self-paced and small group learning, and it connects to that learning how to be more of a proactive, independent learner. And a student-centered learning, which means that the student is at the center of their classroom experience and not the teacher. Now, on an elementary school level, that, that is something that takes a lot of scaffolding, and it's around creating a culture where you give kids more and more opportunities as they get older. Um, to, to be steering some of their own learning. Differentiated instruction is something that we know is, a, is, is very important. Looking at different kinds of learners, trying to scaffold uh, activities and lessons in such a way that, that kids that are very kinesthetic or kids that are very visual or kids that have language um, uh, challenges or ELL, um, English language learners, we need to be able to differentiate within our classroom. And, and that's a huge challenge, but it also is, is something um, that, that, that teachers know is incredibly important. 
anywhere in time learning is, uh, as you see, you see this very much happening on the high school level and on the post-secondary level with massive online open courses, with virtual delivery and flipped classrooms. A flipped classroom is where you watch uh, the lecture at home or maybe you go on to Khan Academy. You, and the good thing about that is you can play it over and over again. And, and so, and then you come in with your questions and then you can process it. So there actually can be more interaction than just watching uh, a teacher give a lecture. Um, and then you're interacting about the material and that's what happens in the classroom. Inquiry-based instruction is when there's a problem or a project, it could have a community development focus, um, and it should be meaningful and authentic to students. There's a performance assessment that's not just taking a test, but might involve a presentation of learning or a product that students have created. And so that has implications for schools as well. We need to have good storage, we need to have furniture that allows kids to spread out. We need to have display and exhibition <coughs> venues on the walls. So I talked about the four C's, they're very much connected to Common Core. A lot of schools are trying to experiment with ways to do more kind of applied and, and kind of hands-on, um, heads-on, hands-on um, programs. Now STEM and STEAM is a big part of that. Um, STEM is the science, technology, engineering, and math. Of course we're concerned about that because that's where over 50% of the jobs are. Actually, only 17% of students are majoring on that in those, in those fields on the college level. And so there's been a huge push over the last 10 years by the federal government to promote STEM programs. Now, STEAM is taking art and humanities and using it as the glue to get kids engaged in science, technology, engineering, thinking. And, and that's really, I think, been a very successful, um, a very successful move. So a lot of schools are thinking about STEAM. And it's, it's nothing new, it's kind of a meta-discipline. It's putting it all together, it's integrating, it's stuff that a lot of us were doing uh, in the, it, you know, many years ago. It's good constructivist education, um, but it's also very connected to the maker movement and tinkering and hands-on and next-gen science standards um, are all about practices, about learning science concepts and content through practices that are applied. Um, so, another big thing I think that's connected to this is the resurgence of CTE, or career technical education. A lot, of, a lot of districts are kind of like ramping up their vocational programs, which were kind of dying in the 90s and in the early part of this century, um, because it, it, that does have that combination of head and hand, and it's something that's practical and it's applied. The thing about the CTE programs now is that they have a higher level of academic and technology kind of expectation. So we're coming to a place where kind of that what, what Ken Robinson was talking about with that dichotomy between heads-on and hands-on or vocational academic is kind of starting to meet in the middle because more and more we need people that can do both. And we've talked about academic mindset. Community partnerships um, are something that a lot of schools are trying to leverage. Instead of thinking about the community as separate, really bringing the community in as a resource. So, on that note, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you get into these small groups in the interest of time and start, and what, I, what you have in your handout is some list of 21st century skills. Um, and so, what I'd like you to do is try and create groups of maybe six people around a table and try and get as much of a mixture of of parents and teachers, and I know some of you are both um, uh, in the group, and, um, and start some conversations. What you might want to do is take a look first for about five minutes at this handout that I gave you and circle the things that, that really kind of um, are interesting to you or you think most express uh, what, your, what your learning goals are for your child um, or what you think about, um, and then you can talk about it as a group. And, um, and then there's a place for you to, um, to list those, those skills on your sheet. So we can, uh, if we have, I don't know if we're gonna have time to sort of make lists as a group, but we'll see how it goes, the conversation, okay?
about some work that they're doing to illustrate, I think, some of the skills that we're talking about here. Uh, and then I'm going to shift into just showing you a few images about space and some of the things that we're going to be thinking about as we think about designing a new building or renovating a building. All right, so what are, what are some of the conversations people are having about? <laughs> we were just sort of chatting about, yeah. you know, in a perfect world, it would be wonderful to have a really big space or a classroom where you can just throw in building materials like uh, Lincoln Lofts or things. Some kids aren't going to use this anymore. Yeah. Recycle stuff, just to let them create on their own and without yeah. anybody telling them how to do it or what to build. Um, maybe for indoor recess or for an incentive in the classroom. Um, right. But just to have a nice space where there's safe building materials that allow them to create right. and to collaborate with each other. Yeah, and what you're talking about is really sort of what people are referring to as makerspace. Um, and, and you know, fancy word for just having a space where there's lots of different materials and you can get messy and there's table surfaces and there's good storage and you can make things. And I've seen more and more schools that are trying to build in maker corners into their classrooms. So that it's so that the whole the, every classroom can have some element of that, but you might have a special space, and it might be the art classroom that converts into that. Or the cafeteria, because really yeah, or the cafeteria. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, was anybody talking about skills particularly, or that were kind of that they were resonating with them, or was the conversation veering off in other directions? And that's okay. A lot of beer. Okay. Anything else that any of the groups want to share? Yeah. Yeah, it's a process, and it's and it's kind of it's that learning how to learn. I know you were talking about that, right? Learning how to learn, and um, and part of that is kind of um, it's kind of being you have to be reflective to learn how to learn because it's metacognitive. It's kind of like you're watching yourself mm -hmm. and kind of reflecting on what am I doing here? Or what can I do differently? show the work and you exhibit the work, but exhibitions uh, might be a more formal thing. So in Framingham, I'm working with um, the K-5 uh, STEAM Academy there at the Kennedy, and, and they have an exhibition, they had an exhibition with the kindergartners exhibiting their, they did some, they each made structures to, for the, for the, the um, what's the story with the, the three little, the pigs and the blowing, the wolf blowing, up, right? Blowing the house down. And they had to make a structure, and they had to engineer it, and they had to do drawings, and they had to, and then they, then they had a, a, a fan that was blowing it, and they were talking the people through. 
their whole process of designing it and building it. Um, but it's highly motivating to have exhibitions because, um, because it's an authentic experience for kids. And then they, they really think about the quality of the work they're doing and they want to do a good job. So there's, there, are, there are many schools that have, that's part of the culture. They have regularly scheduled kind of exhibitions or celebrations of student work. So, anything else? Yeah. Um, just, I think the idea was like, be who you want to be. I think that was um, learning toward, like self-directed learning, but learning so you're motivated. So you, the kids want to come to school, they want to put the effort into it because it's exciting. Yeah. And they want, they're, they're coming because they want to do it and they're working hard because they want to do it. Because they're self-motivated. It's cracking that motivation, not, you know, but it's got to be, it can't be, it, there has to be some element of voice and choice, yeah. I think, for kids to feel motivated, right. to feel like they're, they, you have, there has to be a place that they kind of, they decide to engage, mm -hmm. um, and they, because they feel supported also in doing that. All right, I'm going to keep us moving. I'm going to show us a five-minute video that, um, this is from a school, an elementary school that I've worked with, lived in San Diego. Um, and it's just three minutes long.
to show that because just to kind of illustrate some of the skills that we're talking about. And, and, and I, I actually have another video, but we're not going to have time for it. Um, but you could, if you want to, you can look at it online. It's called Media Saves the Beach. Just go to YouTube, Media Saves the Beach. It's a group of high school students from the same school because it's a K-12 kind of district. And they're talking about a project that will really kind of blow you away, where they where they did where they made the movie first of all that that is um, that is the video that you look at, but it but it talks about on a very different level, um, sort of that kind of research and that kind of independent um, sort of problem solving and collaborative work and creative kind of endeavor. Uh, but what I like I love that kid who's talking about inferring and describing the you know because it's not like you. It's, it's not like engaging kids in, a, in an approach that's more proactive or student-centered isn't every bit as rigorous. It's, it's at, or covering content or covering standards. He was just, he was actually reading the state standards, but he had kind of internalized them. He was actually learning what those words meant to, you know, to infer and describe and to look at multiple perspectives, which is, you know, what the state standards told, told him. So I'm gonna talk about design patterns um, for, the next uh, 15 minutes or so to just give you a sense of some of the ways that um, we were, we're going to approach looking at the building. Um, and we've been, as I said, we're working with this the leadership team to kind of see what patterns make most sense um, and, and with the teacher, which includes the leadership from both schools, the Warndale and Peebles, and, um, and we'll be you know, checking in with teachers about that as well and sharing it with the public as well. Um, so these are just, I mean, I guess the basic premises here is, you don't, here is you don't know what you don't know, right? So all of us are used to a certain way of school buildings being. So I just want to show you some other things that we can think about. And as we talked about at the beginning, we really need buildings to be flexible, not only because of te the technology piece, but because technology enables us to not waste a lot of space and it enables us to have much more flexible environments. And we know that a lot of good teaching, a lot of good learning experience happen through communities being built where teachers can collaborate, where they can team, where kids don't fall through the cracks, and where kids and adults feel like they own their own environment. It doesn't feel institutional. It feels like there's really a strong sense of ownership. And what that does is it really increases the level of accountability Vandalism disappears because you don't vandalize your own living room, right? So, so the, there's a lot wrapped up in this notion of making spaces that really feel like they can be customized to the needs of the learning communities that occupy them. Um, so, reading and gatekeeping. Um, I know that someone had mentioned already. Of course, we're going to be incredibly concerned about security, and part of that is creating a you know a bottleneck a gatekeeping mechanism that's a safe entry for the school but once you get into the school what is the experience like and too often you go into schools i'd say 98 percent of the time and there's no there there you know you walk in and it's like it's hard to find the office and there's you don't really get a strong sense of the school so we have an opportunity here to really think about what does it feel like when you enter the school how do you get a sense of what's happening? Is there student work on display? Is there a friendly person greeting you? Is there a notice board with all the stuff that's going on or maybe a flat screen monitor that shows you the different things going on in the school? Um, and so um, we'll be thinking about that. Also wayfinding. How do you find your way through the school? And the notion of streetscapes is instead of hallways being just a straight line shot, what if when you walk through the building you could see different things, that it was easy to find your way around? And there were things on display or views into seeing adults uh, meeting, collaborating, working, uh, views into the adults that provide services to parents and students. Um, so that's another thing we're going to be thinking about. Uh, seamless technology and blended learning, how did that happen when, you know, in, in the most natural way so that technology is used as a tool when you need it. It has there are places to store it, there are places to charge it, there are places to spread out, or there, you know, you can go sit in, in, in the hallway in different areas and use it maybe. Um, so that's ubiquitous learning. Spreading this is a, this is a elementary school in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. 
that has um, has views out from its classrooms <coughs> into these kind of like connected learning spaces that class that different classrooms share, and that and that lots of different kind of activities can happen out there. Here's a library where you know, you've got these platforms where kids can can sit on and and, and read and. and um, I think we were talking over here about how some kids like to lounge, some kids like to sit up straight, um, and obviously you got to make sure they're they're focusing. But uh, how can we um, create different kinds of environments? And here's a commons area um, with some soft seating in it that enables you to have kind of gatherings and maybe um, community meetings. So here's another example in that conference school about gathering spaces for either small gatherings or or larger gatherings. Now, one thing we know, we're probably going to be having a cafetorium. That's what the MSBA uh, provides. We know that the gymnatorium is a big problem because the gym is used all day, and then it's hard to be doing things with in, in theater or music when the gym is being used. So it makes more sense to locate it in the caf in the, in the cafeteria. And we're also going to be looking at really making that cafeteria space more flexible. And varied spaces, you know, are there small, kids love smaller spaces and where they can hide in plain sight, you know, where you can see them, but they can really feel like they're, um, they're in a space that they can make their own. Um, here's an example of the cafetorium spaces. And part of that, too, is really looking at furniture that's as flexible as possible. That, what's that? That's our school. Oh, that's our school. There you go. Um, and, and part of that is, 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 is looking at spaces that are, that are that furniture that can be, that, that you can move easily and clear out the space. Which, well, which is your school here? This one here? Um, right there. That's, yeah. that's, that's your school? It looks like it. It looks, it looks like, like it, like yeah. That. Yeah, because yeah. oh, yeah, you you're at the Bourneville. Well, I was. Yeah. Or you were. Yeah. Yes, you said you were. Yes. Um, visible learning and transparency. So this is kind of counterintuitive for some people. And, but if you have more transparency in the school, it makes learning more visible, it makes teachers less isolated, and it makes it easier for kids to move around the space and for there to be informal supervision and su surveillance. Now, we know that kids get distracted too, so you have to balance that out with areas where kids won't get distracted as much. And using glass in some places that opens up into the hallways, maybe, um, or here that connects into a breakout room that's in between some classrooms. Um, but what it does allow is, is, is for that um, learning to become more sort of palpable and for, for community to be built in different ways. So we want to be thinking about where we can use transparency. Now, glass is expensive. It's a fire code issue. So we, we have to use it well where we can, and we'll be thinking about that. Wherever there is glass, there's also a blind, because the question always comes up about what about lockdowns, what about privacy. So there has to, it's about flexibility. So there's glass that allows you to have connect or interconnectivity, and there's blinds that allow you to close things off. Um, display and exhibition, how do you facilitate that? That's also a fire code issue. Things have to be behind glass. At Borndale, actually, there's some nice cases that throughout, throughout the hallway. So we're going to be thinking about how does that how does that happen? How do we cluster learning? Here's some examples of a collection of classrooms. Now this one, these two happen to have a movable wall in between them, which allows you to really not some again expensive. You wouldn't want to use it in a lot of places, but you might. There might be some places where a movable wall would really make sense. And the movable walls that we can provide these days have very good acoustic ratings. If you close them, it's like a solid wall. So it's not like you're distracted by noise. But what it does allow you to do is instead of a 900 square foot classroom, you suddenly have 1,800 square feet. Or if you're doing some teaming, it really allows you to physically sort of do that. Um, now these classrooms also have a teacher work area that's connected to it and sort of a, a learning hub, a project-based studio right here. Um, here's some classrooms. Uh, this is at Ipswich Middle High School sets of double doors in between them. And I know that you, we, so the teachers here talked about how much they like the doors between their classrooms. So we'll be thinking about that as well. And what happens when you cluster those classrooms is you can create a neighborhood. Now this is a high school. This is Essex Tech and, um, that just was opened, opened 
um, a year and a half ago. And what happened here is we, we expanded the hallway a little bit, created a seating area. It's all wired. There's a science room next to a math room next to humanities classes that allow you to have that integrated kind of experience. Now, in an elementary school level, it would be more like, how do we want to cluster the grades? How do we want to make a, a small school feel even smaller? Um, and how do we create uh, sort of neighborhood environments that kids and teachers so well can to? Here's another example of a grade level neighborhood where some connected classrooms, teacher offices, and then a space that they share. In any case, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to have a really agile classroom, a really flexible classroom. And that could be furniture, ergonomic seating. Um, we want chairs that give, have a little bounce to them and that enable kids to fidget because they concentrate much better that way. Um, we want them to be easy to move around and rearrange. Um, those tablet arm desks are really pretty clunky and not don't really allow for a lot of flexibility, so we'll probably be looking at tables um, that, and I know a number of the teachers here said that that's what they were really interested in, is more flexible table surfaces. But here you can see, well, here's a connection between uh, two classes with a roll-up door that's a, that's a garage door, that's an interior use of this garage door, but it opens up these classrooms to each other. Another thing is um, having sinks in classrooms when possible. Uh, having floor surfaces that are easy to clean and don't get messy, um, and you can do lots of different things. And, of course, technology is part of that, having very consistent technology within the classroom. And technology is something that we order very last before the building, you know, gets, gets as the building is getting furnished because it's, it's evolving so quickly. And here's some more examples of some flexible furniture. Uh, these home furniture, did you have some somewhere in the district? Was someone talking about how you, you don't have any of these? Uh, kids want, right? The aesthetic? Yeah, at the innovation studio. Kids love these, and they're not that expensive. And, um, and so the good news is for school furniture manufacturers are really thinking about how to make affordable, flexible, relatively lightweight, but very sturdy furniture. And so we'll be looking at that. Um, and then classrooms that enable you to zone them in different ways, particularly in the younger grades, so you've got different zones within them. And collaborative environments, a lot of that is around furniture as well. And community access. So here's, this is a, a West Bridgewater that, um, that Flansburg just completed and just opened about two months ago, right? So um, here we've got the gym and the cafeteria and the auditorium all in one way along this double height sort of streetscape. Um, and the academic areas can be closed off. Um, another thing, that, so that's so community has access to that um, after hours of the meeting. Another thing that's nice about this plan is that we've got local air, uh, um, cable access TV based here connected to art and a, and a, and a computer uh, lab and a robotics lab, and upstairs is science and math, so there's this whole little steam wing. So they've taken the MSBA square footage and used it in some really creative ways um, to create different neighborhoods. Here you see classrooms clustered with a small, just very small extension of the corridor there, but it, it, it allows you to have a small group seminar space, and that brings those classrooms together as a community. Indoor outdoor connections, really maximizing sort of the use of that. Uh, I want to go back to here actually because I know someone mentioned having an interior outside space that's protected, and that's another thing that this building does very nicely. Nicely, there's an interior courtyard, classrooms open out into it, um, and, and it's a it's a good sized courtyard that's really kind of not only brings light into the school, uh, into the classrooms, but also is used um, very. Uh, So here's some other examples of creating those connections between indoor and outdoor. Another thing that we're looking at is the notion of distributing resources. How do you put the adults that are working with kids in close proximity to them um, as opposed to having all the administration in one place? Now, some administrative functions need to be in one place. But in this middle school, all of these darker green offices Here's the conference room, here's the dean of students, here's the IT, these are teacher offices or collaboration rooms, reception. They're all located along the street. You don't need a pass to go to the bathroom here because you've got three to five
five sets of adult eyes on you anytime you are moving through the school. So we want to make schools that are feel less anonymous. You can't sort of be unknown in this, in this building. And we talk about maker space for labs. Here's an elementary school maker space. So it's just got simple shelving, nice flat tables. Kids can build a lot of cool stuff. Branding and identity. Um, branding is a lot around you know, use of color and materials and how do we create different zones within within the school building that feel like they have their own identity, their own sense of place, and that could connect to neighborhoods or um, different grade level configurations within the school. Uh, and then this is the last one, building a teacher. So can we expose some of the systems, which is nice anyway to have taller ceilings um, in some areas, but also um, in, 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 in an elementary school that I work with in San Diego, um, there's a touch screen monitor. Kids are monitoring the energy uses of the building minute by minute. They can, they can see how much electricity is being used, how much water is being used, and it's part of the curriculum. So the building itself becomes a teaching tool. All right, so those are, I just wanted to give you a little bit of kind of a glimpse of some of the stuff that we'll be looking at from a building standpoint. Um, and, uh, and translating those, that, that kind of educational vision that the, that the district is really kind of helping to, to provide a narrative for um, into ideas about space and what's going to work best for the new school building. So I think now we want to open it up for questions sure. and some, any discussion or questions. During this phase, um, learning design program phase, which will finish uh, in the middle of December, we'll have two more community meetings. The following phase, January to April, we'll probably have two more community meetings then. And then uh, the schematic design phase, which would be June through early fall, uh, we'd have several more community meetings. Because there's no new baby. Because 
because what's happening in our town is that it's too expensive for new families to move here. Other families, eight, they have like a study that says that people from 18 to 35 are actually exiting Bourne. And why is that? Because they're, they can't afford to live here. That's a good point, but statewide, we're losing population in our right. state. It's not just born. Right. There's a demographic problem across our state. And so they're predicting with all that they have, I don't know if they call them actuaries or number crunchers or whatever you want to call them. But they sit there and they go over, they pile over all these demographic numbers for our community. They do a 10, 20 year span out for all of our demographics. And they believe they support a building of around 250 students moving forward. What if they're wrong? Then the board community has to come back and retool what we do. Right, but that's their reimbursement rates on, on the K-4 single schools around 250 students. That doesn't mean that the community can't say we want something a little bit bigger, but it's our, that will be our expense if we do that. But they, they crunch all the, the data and all the stuff and all the new demographic studies. They're very good at what they do. We question them. We went up there several times. Question them, brought in a lot of information, and we argued some points, but Again, that's, that's, they're good at what they do. They don't support low class size and the community uh, initiative. If the community believes in that, then you have to come up with the extra funding to have extra classrooms.
happened is we had one, we had more people mm -hmm. one, one amount of money. That we waited too long, that wasn't enough. Yeah. We went back, we went out, and then there was a plan for five, a, a pod bill, five separate buildings interconnected. Right. When we had to amass the money for that, we did an extra roughly twenty billion dollars. We were closing up. Yeah. So what you what one deal you what you see in one deal on entry yeah. is based on the original authorization of twenty eight million dollars. And we had a bill with the company who we had envelopes. Yeah. It would be a loan and then we had to go back and decide put an add on an add on one at a time, one at a time. Right. In fact the biggest debate was the, the half size versus the full size gym. Yeah. In order happened is before they, they, they start mobilizing, um, the um, break the structure said, we can, we can add the other half of the gym for $750,000. I was the only one at Bob, everybody else said no. Yeah. I couldn't get a second when I wanted a full size gym. Now I look at it today, that school is backed up from the turnkey 2009. Targeting November 17th is a possible next meeting, and we're targeting the week of December 7th and 8th as a possible next meeting. We'll confirm those this week. Huh? <laughs> 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 